challenge people to step outside their comfort zone. And uh, God kind of laid Brother Billy on my heart. I didn't want this to be the Wade Copeland show today. and I'm the only face you've, you've seen so far. And so uh, I wanted to mix it up a little bit. And so I appreciate a man of God that will get up and, and, um, and do what's necessary for the cause of Christ. And, and uh, we need some more men uh, in our church that are willing to step up and do those sort of things. And so uh, let's get ready this morning to have a good time in God's house. As you're turning over to the book of the Proverbs, book of the Proverbs this morning, we're going to be in chapter 1, just at the very beginning, just to kind of set the stage of, you know, what is it about Proverbs we need to understand, what do we need to understand about Solomon, and then we'll be over to uh, Proverbs 24 for our text this morning. And, uh, and so I uh, want to encourage you this morning to, to do as we said as, at the beginning, open your hearts. Uh, I assure you this morning that the, the subject matter is a difficult subject matter. It's something that I've really struggled with. with. You can ask Rhonda. I don't know that I've ever struggled with a message as much as I have this one. I tried so many times to go a different direction, and God kept bringing me back here. And so you all know, pray for me this morning. Uh, I'm, I always love the opportunity to preach. I always in, enjoy preaching. Uh, it doesn't make me anxious or nervous or anything else, but I always want to bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, and, and so pray for me. I've really struggled with uh, breathing this last couple of weeks, especially this last week, uh, asthma problems. And so um, you can look at it one of two ways. You can pray and say, well, maybe his voice won't hold out, uh, or you'll pray for me and say, Lord, I hope his voice holds out. And uh, uh, that just remains to be seen. You know, I was thinking about our church just a moment ago, and uh, we are a close-knit bunch, and we're comfortable together, amen? Isn't that a good thing, to be comfortable around brothers and sisters in Christ? Friends, I've been in churches that are cold. I've been in churches that are just cold, and they're, 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 they're wet, you know, uh, they're soggy, they're, there's just not, no, no substance there. You know, I heard about a man that was visiting churches, and, and he went into a church, and, and uh, the church was very formal and, and all these things. And, and, and so as he was sitting there listening to the pastor preach, he uh, liked one of the things that the pastor said, and he said, Amen. And uh, everybody uh, there in the, in the sanctuary kind of turned around and looked at him like, what in the world was that? And uh, so a little ways down the road, he pastor said something else again, and, and the man said, Hallelujah. That's hard for a Baptist to say, you know that. Uh, hallelujah. And, uh, I mean, now every head in the place turned, and they looked, and here comes the usher. And the usher tapped on the fella shoulder and said, What are you doing? And he, the man said, I, I just feel the presence of God, and I'm excited about it. And the man, the usher looked at him and said, well, you didn't feel it here, so would you please stop? You know, there's a lot of churches like that today. Let's don't be one of them, amen? Let's be a church that's on fire and excited about what the Lord Jesus Christ is doing. And not so much maybe for you what he is doing, but what he wants to do. What God wants to do in your life today. And that's really kind of where the message is going, because I fear... Uh, uh, what we're going to be considering this morning may be true of someone in the sanctuary today, okay? And so Proverbs chapter 1, uh, we're going to uh, be getting to 24, uh, Proverbs 24 in just a minute. But you need to understand something about Solomon. Uh, he spells out his purpose in the very few, first few verses of chapter 1 uh, with regards to the Proverbs and what they are. And... Um, he begins there, uh, of course, in verse 1, but we'll look in verse 2. We're going to read down through verse 6. It says, To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity, to give subtly to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion, 
a wise man, I want you to hear this, a wise man will hear and will increase in learning. That's what's going to happen today for those that are wise enough to avail themselves of the opportunity to be under the sound of the preaching of the Word of God. They had the opportunity this morning to increase in learning. A man of understanding will attain unto wise counsels. Friends, Wade Copeland doesn't have the wise counsels, but God's Word does. And the man of God that stands behind this sacred desk just at any given moment, if he's a truly a, a, a called of God, he will have wise counsels if he's in the Word of God. And then verse 6, to understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. And so Solomon, we know that uh, he was David's son and he took the, the throne after David and uh, uh, he really captivated God's heart when he could have asked for anything and everything and he asked for wisdom. He asked for the ability to discern right from wrong. And, and this pleased God greatly, and God gave him uh, not, so much, not just wisdom, but he gave him uh, uh, as much wisdom as any man on the face of this earth has ever had outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so under the inspiration of God now, he's spelled out what the Proverbs are all about. We're going to go over to chapter 24 now, and I want you to know something about this particular pro proverb. It falls in a section of Proverbs that a lot of people would call situational Proverbs, situational wisdom, meaning that you look at situations that, that, that you come across in life, you may, that you may be experiencing in life, and, and you learn lessons based on those things. And, and friends, can I tell you something? If you'll open your heart and you'll open your mind and you'll allow the Lord to uh, Jesus to have full reign of your life, God's got lessons to teach us any given moment on any given day. Amen? I'm telling you, it doesn't just have to happen here in the church. It should, and we pray to God that it will. But I'm telling you, God wants to teach us as we go. And that's what Solomon did. And that's what we're going to be looking at together here in just a few moments. But before we do, we need to go to the Lord, Lord Jesus one more time and pray for His blessing. Uh, for the sake of the, of, the, of the Word of God and for the sake of you and I to hear what God has to say. Father God, we, we count it no small thing, again, to be in your presence, to know, Lord, that as we are here gathered together, Lord, for a singular purpose, Lord, to, to certainly glorify you as we've mentioned and as we've uh, attempted to do, Lord. And then, Father... We want to hear from you today. But Father, we can only hear if our hearts are engaged today. We can only hear, Lord, if the Spirit of God is, is, has free reign in our lives. And I fear today, Father, that there's individuals to, that, that are going so much through the motions, Lord, that they're not allowing the Spirit of God to have control. Lord, they're not allowing the Spirit of God to give them the ears to hear what the Word of God has to say. And Father, we don't want to miss what is going to be preached here today or any given moment, Lord, that we're in the Word of God. And so, Father, I pray that you would just help us just right now, right where we're at, just to take a deep breath and say, Lord, you have my undivided attention. I want to hear from you today. I want to hear what you have to say to me. I don't want to push it off and say that it, that's a message someone else should be listening to. Oh, so-and-so that's not here today, boy, they ought to really be here. The fact of the matter is, Lord, they're not. We are. And so, Lord, my prayer is that today that, dear God, would you just tender our hearts. We need to, we need to be ready, Lord, and, 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 and I just ask you, just tender us, Lord, to, to hear what the Word of God truly has to say to us. And to not, not push it aside, Lord, and, 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 and not uh, retract from it, Lord, because it's uncomfortable. But to be honest, Father, before you, Lord God, you know our hearts. You know where we're at right now spiritually. And Lord, we need a fresh touch of your hand today. 
Lord, I know that this, this preacher needs your touch today. Lord, you know what I need for the sake of the gospel. Dear God, I pray that you would put in my mind, in my heart, and in my mouth the words you want spoken today. And above all else, you're glorified and honored. And Lord, that you're pleased. It's in Christ Jesus' name we ask it all. And all God's people said, all right. So as I mentioned, we're in a, a situational type of, of uh, proverb. It's a situation that Solomon observed and he learned from. He saw this situation and he learned from this situation. And then being who he was under the inspiration of God, he wrote this, this, this thing down for us to learn from as well. And so that's our goal today. And so we'll, without any further uh, hindrance, let's just move on to, to chapter 24. Look what's being down in the, uh, the last uh, five verses there, beginning in verse 30. And Solomon says these words. Now I want you to, to understand something. Solomon's the king. Solomon's the king. And while a lot of kings would be sitting on their thrones and, and have other people taking care of this, that, and the other, Solomon was more of a hands-on type king. One of the things that I really admired about him. He had his faults, we know, but this part I really liked about him because he was out and about. And he says in verse 30 that I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof. And the stone wall thereof was broken down. Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as one or excuse me, as an armed man. You know, folks, we can't turn on our TVs today without seeing tragedies. We can't turn on our TVs today without seeing one tragedy or another. There's tragedies across the world. There's tragedies taking place right here in our country. There's tragedies taking place in our state. There's certainly tragedies that have happened and taken place here in Wichita Falls. And, and we perhaps have experienced tragedies in our homes. But I don't think there's any greater tragedy. In fact, I think it's a tragedy that really is at the root of all other tragedies in some shape, form, or fashion than what is potentially taking place in churches even this morning. Perhaps even here at Liberty Baptist. The tragedy of spiritual laziness, the tragedy of apathy, spiritual laziness and apathy, as I read it from the perspective of Solomon, is a tragedy. It's tragic. And so that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. And I want you to be real cautious as I prayed just a moment ago for us as we go through this message, not to be guilty of thinking, oh, I wish so-and-so was here to hear this. Or I wish my, my, my family member was, was here to hear this. Friends, you're here this morning. And, and, and I believe in a sovereign God. Can I get an amen? I don't believe in accidents with God. And because there are no accidents with God, and because you are here today, you're here with a purpose, all right? God's purpose is to speak to you today. Yes, He wants to speak to your neighbor. Yes, He wants to speak to the one across the aisle. Yes, He wants to speak to even old Brother Motley back there. But He wants to speak to you. And I didn't say old, brother. I said old. We're going to look at this tragedy, this tragedy of spiritual laziness that I believe has infiltrated the church and, and it's become more and more prevalent. And, and this laziness leads to this apathy. What is apathy? It's just a lack of concern. It's a lack of care. It's a lack of desire to, 
to, to do anything. And friends, when it comes to spiritual matters, that, that is tragic. And we must deal with it. We must be able to recognize it, number one. And that's what we find. And in verse 30, we find Solomon, as he's walking, he goes by this field and he says, Hey, I I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. Solomon gives two descriptions of a man. Two descriptions of a man whose property he went by. It's interesting, isn't it? It's interesting what can be deduced about a person by just looking at their life. Just looking at the fruits of their lives. And before you say, well, that's judgmental, Brother Wade. Uh, you, You shouldn't judge people that way. Hey, hey, slow down just a little bit. Jesus made it very clear in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 16 through 20. He said, ye shall know them by their fruits. You can look at a person's life and you can get a pretty good indication of where they are spiritually. You can take a a look at a a person's life and and, and, and everything about their life and you get a pretty good indication of, of how solid they are and how foundational they are in their faith. Jesus goes on to say, Do men gather grapes of of thorns or figs of thistles? Of course not. Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. What's he talking about? The fruit of our lives. That which, which comes from a life and how it's lived. He goes on to say, A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down, it's cut down, and it's cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Friends, our lives reflect where we are spiritually. And that reflection can be seen. The problem is, are we seeing it? Are we taking note? Think about the language he uses. The word slothful literally just means that this man was not only lazy, he was given to laziness. He he was given to laziness. He goes on to call this man a man void of understanding. Void of understanding. And, and, and that literally means that he didn't have any heart for what it took to maintain that field and that vineyard. He, he had no desire. It, it was not in his heart any longer. In other words, it was obvious to Solomon that this man had apathy. He could care less. He could care less about, about the fruit of his labor. He wasn't even interested in it. You know, you could, like I said, you could, you could, a whole lot of things you can tell about a person. And I don't want to oversimplify this, but I couldn't help but think back to my childhood. I had a mamma and papa, that's what I called them. And they were pretty old when, when, when I was a little boy. I have some of the fondest memories of being over at my mamma and papa's house. I want to tell you something, they were poor. They were poor. In terms of material possessions, they had nothing. My friends, let me tell you about what they did have. They had a little two-bedroom house. A little two-bedroom house that when I walked in the doors, you could be sure the floors were going to be swept. The furniture was going to be dusted. Everything was going to be put up and in its place. It wasn't a fancy house. He had the old asbestos shingle siding on the sides. Had that old squeaky uh, screen door. Had that hollow core front door that leaked air, and the windows, they leaked air. And, and so there was a number of times that my mamma would be, we would be sweeping the floor on a, on, on a two or three times a day basis. But what I learned from watching her do that on top of watching my papa. Here was this man with this little tiny house. 
nothing beautiful, neat, clean, with a yard that was immaculate. Absolutely immaculate. And he took care of that, that yard. And, and you never found a weed. And if you found a weed, you'd find him out there with his pocket knife down on a knee digging that weed out. He cared about what he had. He cared and understood that what he had may not have been fancy in the, from a viewpoint of, of the world, but for him it was everything. For my mammal, it was everything. Can I tell you, it instilled in me a, a, an understanding that, that what I have comes from God and I should nurture it and I should take care of it and it should show that, that, that I'm, I'm, I'm proud of what God's given me. And that's a simple, simple truth, but it really has great spiritual import. That which you nurture will grow. That which you take care of will, will, will flourish. What I find interesting about this very first verse is not so much uh, the, the yet the, the, the field or the vineyard, it's the, the, script, the description we see of the man. You know? As he wa walks by, he sees this field, he sees this vineyard, but what, where does his mind go? Where does Solomon's mind go? It goes to the man that owns that field. It goes to that man. It doesn't go to the field. It goes to him. And it's a reflection of that man. It's a condition of that man that Solomon uh, uh, saw. Friends, our, our daily lives really and truly reflect who we are. Did you hear what I said? Our daily lives are a reflection of who we are. We may not like that, it's the truth nonetheless. There's nothing that gives us a clearer picture of who we are than the Word of God. Don't you love that? I need the Word of God to, to, to open my eyes to where I'm at spiritually, to open my eyes to, to who I am, and, and perhaps maybe a road that I'm going down I shouldn't be going down. I need the stop signs we find in the Word of God. I need the directions that we find in the Word of God. I need the input that God's Word gives to us. James tells us about be, not being just doers of the Word and hearers, or rather being doers of the Word and not just hearers, deceiving ourselves. He goes on to say, For if any man be a hearer of the Word, in other words, if you're sitting here this morning and you're just listening to this message and you, and you get a glimpse of what God's wanting you to see about your life right now, and you walk away from it, you're like a man that beholds yourself in a mirror, a natural glass, the Word of God says, and you turn away from it, and you go your way, and you forget what you just saw. The Word of God gives us a reflection of where we are spiritually. The Word of God is what we need to stay on track. I ask you a question this morning, and it's perhaps one of the most significant questions I could ask you. What does Jesus see when he looks at your life? In the end, that's all that counts, amen? What does Jesus see when he looks at your life? Friends, make no mistake, we're in dangerous times. It's becoming easier and easier and easier to slip away from the things of God. We're seeing it in our churches. I know that this is a holiday weekend. And I know, you know, even our pastor needed to get away, and I'm grateful that he, he and his family were able to do that. They need to be able to do that from time to time. But I assure you that, that he's in God's house this morning somewhere. Hopefully not in Arkansas. No, I'm just kidding. I got family in Arkansas. But friends, I, I, I'm telling you, we need to understand that we're in dangerous times. The Word of God gives us the warnings we need to be alert to what's going on around us, how we need to stand, and how we need to walk and live. When you look over in Ephesians chapter 5, 
the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In verse 14 says, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly. What does circumspectly mean? Meaning that you're alert to what's going on around you. You're alert to who you are. You're alert that you're walking towards a trap. Because Satan's a liar and, and he's a lion and he's, he's seeking whom he may devour at any given moment. And friends, those aren't just so many words. When the Word of God warns us, we must heed it. Walk circumspectly, he says, not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. How much more so is that true today in our own lives? Could it be said of you that you're slothful this morning? I'm not pointing your, the finger at you. I'm telling you, God dealt with me mightily in this message. Could it be that we're slothful and that we lack understanding? Let me give you some things to consider when you consider those two questions. Are you in the Word of God daily? Or can you easily skip over a day? Can you tell when you haven't been in God's Word? Do you long to be under the preaching and teaching of God's Word? Or can you take it or leave it? Do you take seriously eternal matters? you take seriously that the Lord Jesus could split the eastern sky open right now? Do you take seriously that when He does, it's done? Or are you living for today and what this world can give you? Do you care about the spiritual conditions of your loved ones? Those that God's put in your life, perhaps, that you work with? Do you reckon how that one day if they don't come to the Lord Jesus Christ they're going to stand before Almighty God and give an account for, for why they didn't know the Lord Jesus? And can you just imagine them looking across the way and seeing you standing there in the other line and saying, why didn't you tell me? Friends, it's a tragic, tragic thing when we become spiritually lazy. And it's even more tragic in my mind when we don't care. Can I just tell you this morning, something's wrong with the child of God that just doesn't care. There's something wrong with the church that doesn't have any enthusiasm for seeing people get come to Christ. There's something wrong with, with, with the church today when, when they just come to church for the sake of patting themselves on the back and, and, and saying, I, I did it today. There's something wrong today when we can just go through the motions. And I know I talk about the motions a lot. I know I talk about routine a lot. I know I talk about getting into a rut a lot. And I don't know why, but I guess God really, really has convicted me of that over the years that I don't want to ever get into a moment or a time where I'm just doing it for the sake of doing it. There's eternal consequences at stake. We will stand, and listen to me, believer, we will stand and give an answer. Oh, it don't have any bearing on your eternal destination, friends, but I promise you, it will have a bearing on your eternal reward. And what a shame it'll be when the Lord Jesus comes back. And we have to, according to Scripture, duck our heads in shame because the Bible says that there will be those that are ashamed at His coming. Why would they be ashamed? Oh, maybe because they were lazy? Maybe because any given Sunday they just, hey, I don't feel like going to church today. Any given Monday, I, I don't really have time to spend any time in God's Word. 
And worse than that, they don't care. They don't even care. It's tragic. It's tragic. Make no mistake, friends, failure to be engaged spiritually, failure to grow in the Lord daily, can and it will lead to spiritual laziness and spiritual apathy. If you don't nurture what you have, you're going to be the man that Solomon's, who Solomon's field he walked by. Make no mistake about it. I'm fearful that if we're just honest before God and with ourselves that that we could find ourselves being described as this man. But hey, if we do, do you know, we can get it straightened out. We serve a God of mercy. We serve a God of restoration. Amen? I'm grateful for that. Amen? I'm telling you, friends, right now, and I've tried to be as transparent with you over the years that I've been here with you as I can possibly be. But I'm going to tell you some of these things that God has allowed me to preach, most of which... Uh, here of late have been things that I have dealt with firsthand. I know what happens when we let our guard down. I know what happens when we get spiritually lazy. I know what happens. You say, well, by the way, I can't believe you were ever spiritually lazy. Friends, you're spiritually lazy when you don't get into the Word of God every day. I keep telling you that, but it's true. You're spiritually lazy when you... When, when, I, Say, Brother Wade, you talk about coming to church all the time. Yes, I do, because that's what the Bible says. The Bible says don't forsake it. And friends, I'm, sorry, I'm not going to apologize for that. If the Bible says don't forsake it, then guess what? We don't forsake it, amen? And the Bible says not, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Do you see the day approaching? Not if you're apathetic. Because you just don't care. Oh, Brother Wade, I care. Do you? Is it showing? Is it showing in your life? Because in this gentleman's life here, it wasn't. It wasn't. Secondly, I want you to see that this tragedy is so destructive. It's so destructive. This tragedy of being lazy spiritually, this tragedy of, of being apathetic, just not really caring. Oh, yeah, we may tongue-in-cheek it. We, we, may, we may look at our brother or sister in Christ and, and put on that, that, that fakeness that we can all do as though we really care. But friends, you don't fake it with God. You're not pulling one over on God this morning. He knows where you're at spiritually. And friend, I'm going to tell you something. He wouldn't let me run from it. He's not going to let you run from it. It's too tragic. And its destruction is so great. Look with me in verse 31. After he describes this man of this field, he tells us about that field. He says, this field was low, it was, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof. And then this, the stone wall thereof was broken down. I've told you before, if you sat under my teaching or preaching at any point, it's probably been said, I'm a very visual person. I love to read descriptive language. I really do because I, I, I can envision it. Years and years ago, I worked in a vineyard back right out, out when I was out of high school. It was a friend of my mom's that she had worked with, and they opened up their own vineyard, and it was a beautiful, beautiful vineyard. And I'm going to tell you something. I learned a whole lot about vineyards at that time, and I learned it takes daily, daily work on that vineyard to keep those vines going in the direction that they're supposed to go. Knowing what branch is going to bear fruit and which one isn't, so knowing which one to cut off. Knowing which one to tie up so it'll, it'll do the most. 
knowing that, that if there's anything growing up around that vine, that must be taken out. And there's nothing more beautiful than a vineyard that is properly taken care of. It's gorgeous. And that's what I see when I think of a vineyard. And I think about a country estate with a stone wall built all the way around it. Just kind of meandering through the hills. And then I stop and I say, okay, I got that picture, but now let's look at the picture that Solomon's painting. He's painting a vineyard that's no longer a vineyard. A field that's no longer worth anything other than growing weeds. He says that nothing but thorn bushes have now grown up. Sticker patches where once was a beautiful vineyard, now there's nothing but ugliness. And worse than that, that beautiful stone wall is crumbled. It's broken down. And I, I, I get the picture of that in, in, in such descriptive language that he uses and, and, and what has occurred as a result of this man's laziness and as a result of this man's apathy. How he could let something so beautiful just fall into such disarray. This beautiful vineyard was so far gone, now it had some of the worst, most invasive types of weeds you can imagine. There's nothing worse than an old sticker weed. How many of you remember what goat heads are? Anybody, anybody ever had to fight goat heads before? Because if you ever get them, you're going to fight them for a few years because they're going to come back. I've got this stuff coming up in my yard, and, and, and I think it's from some, some soil that we bought in, 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 in bags, and, and, and it's called nutgrass. And you know that nutgrass is crazy because you can't pull it up. You can try to pull it up, and you'll th you can pull on it, and you think you get it out, but guess what? And unless you've got the little nut that's at the bottom of it, it's, it's coming back. And I've sprayed it, and I've sprayed it, and I've tilled it, and I've tried to mechanically get it out, and it's still, I still have it in the yard. Why, why am I making a big deal out of this? Because, friends, it, when you have a garden, you can't take a day off. When you're trying to grow something good, you can't take a day off from keeping the bad out. You, you, you can't take a break from it. You can't, you can't just ignore it because that's when things get bad. That's when the invasion of weeds come along. You say, Brother Wade, what is, how does that apply? Well, friends, let me tell you something. Anything in our lives God doesn't want is a weed. Do you know that's the definition of a weed? Any undesirable plant? If I had a vineyard and I had a a uh, rose bush come up in the middle of it. Literally, I could call that, that rose bush a weed. It's anything undesired, anything that does not belong. Do you see the application in our lives? If we aren't conscientious about where we're at spiritually, if we're not taking note to not be lazy, if, if we're not... If we're not emphatic about doing the things that God has called us to do. Friends, we'll get to a place where weeds will begin to pop up. And the problem is, 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 is once you get one and you let it go, they'll take over. They'll be, they'll be, over, they'll be overgrown before in, in no time. Next door to our house, there's a house that burned down. It's still there, but for all intents and purposes, it's burned down. Nobody takes care of it anymore. City owns it. City needs to take care of it. But they don't. And there's these vines that grow along our fence line from that, from that house. Rhonda's got a garden. It's a beautiful garden. It's flowers and vegetables and, 
and everything imaginable, everything but the one flower that I love, and she pulled them all up this last year. Anyway, there's this vine that will grow through our fence. It's green. Everything else is green. And if you don't look real close, you won't notice that it has tentacles, and it will begin to wrap itself around all the other plants. That's all I could really think about as I, as I thought about this, is these, 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 these nettles and these thorns that had grown over and covered the face of this, this vineyard. It's just like that vine in our, in our backyard that tries to get into our garden. Friends, Satan's looking for any way he can to infiltrate your life and to grow something that ought not be there. So what does it take to, get, to, to keep the weeds out? What does it take to, to make sure that, that, that what shouldn't be isn't there? What shouldn't be in, that, in, 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 our, in our lives that it, it's not there. I believe there's two things, and probably there could be a bigger list, but for the sake of time, I, I want to share just two things with you. First of all, it takes persistence. It takes persistence. The Bible says, Take heed unto thyself in 1 Timothy 4.16. Take heed unto thyself. What is that saying? Take a look at yourself. Go on and... And, and he says, take heed unto the doctrine. So you t take heed unto yourself and you take heed to thus saith the Lord. How are the two meshing? Do I listen to what God's word says? Or do I just go the mo through the motions of reading it? Continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. This is a persistence, a persistence, a continual persisting in the Word of God. It, it's, it's analyzing yourself against this book on a daily basis. Not just on Sunday, not just on Wednesday night, on a daily basis. Second thing that it comes to mind is it takes devotion. you got to love it. You gotta love it. That little garden that Rhonda's got out there, I tell you what, I stayed after this last year, it didn't do a lick of good. I stayed after, I said, quit planting so many doggone plants. You don't have time to take care of the ones you got. And next time I come would come in, there would be a whole other plat of, of, of plants. Well, I got them for free. I'm, we've got so many plants, folks, I'm telling you, it's a jungle. But man, she nurtures that thing. And she's out there every day. And she's working in that thing. Why? Because she loves it. She loves those plants. She loves that garden. She, she loves to see the fruit coming off that squash plant. She loves to see those peppers coming off that pepper plant. She loves to see the beautiful flowers when they're blooming the way they're supposed to. She, she acknowledges uh, the fact that she loves it and how she treats it. Are you following me this morning? What do you love? What do you love? Jesus said, as the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Love is our motivation, amen? Love is the motivation for doing what we do here at Liberty Baptist Church. Love is the motivation that causes me to want to come to church when I don't feel like coming to church. Love for the Lord Jesus Christ, friends, is the greatest of motivators. I love Psalm 42. In fact, I wanted to preach Psalm 42. I had to argue with God. He won. But I wanted to preach Psalm 42 so bad. I love verse 1 and 2. The Bible says, as the heart Panteth, that heart means a deer. As a deer panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come 
and appear before God. This was an individual that was so in love with God, he just he couldn't get enough. I remember being in cotton fields, and back in the day, you hoed cotton. I know y'all probably don't know much about that around here, but out in West Texas, that's what you did when you was a kid. You hoed cotton. No, you don't hoe the cotton up. You hoe the weeds out of the cotton rows. And I'm going to tell you something. Those rows could get long. And those days were hot. And there was nothing greater than getting to the end of the row where the well was at. You, your mouth would begin to salivate. You were so hot. You were so thirsty. But you could, all you could think about was that well at the end of this one row. And I always remember where those were. And I always knew when I was on that row. And it sure made it easier going down that row, cut, chopping up them weeds. Because I knew when I got to the end of it, I was going to get some of the best tasting fluid on the face of this planet. Well water. Cold, ice cold well water. And that's the picture, that's the language that the psalmist uses. Is it Just as a deer pants after water, so our soul longs after God. We can't get enough of Him. We need more. Give me more. It takes devotion. Well, the weeds, they could be taken care of, but what about the wall? What, what, what is it about this wall? Well, friends, walls are for one thing. They're boundaries. They're boundaries. They're to keep things out that don't belong in. Our government could get a hold of that truth. Amen? We should have a big, beautiful wall. Right? We don't. This was a beautiful wall at one time. And now it's broken down according to, to Solomon. And, and, and this wall was, was there for a purpose. It was there for protection. It was there as a boundary. It was there to keep things out that didn't belong in. And, and now it's broken down. Folks, God sets boundaries for our lives. You read His Word to find out what they are. Throughout the Word of God, God gives us boundaries for our lives. Why? So He can just dictate to us for the sake of dictating to us? Is that the reason He sets boundaries? So many people look at the commandments from God as, as, as with God's some kind of punishment from God. Friends, that's the greatest act of love God could give us to show us what we need to do to stay away from that which will harm us. Walls or boundaries and they're there for a purpose. And friends, listen to me. We don't want them to crumble, but this one had crumbled. Why? Because of the man? Why? Because, well, the man was lazy. Why? Because that laziness had led to an apathy and he just didn't care anymore. And don't you, let me just say this. Don't you sit there for one minute and think that can't happen to you, friend. Don't you sit there right now and say, that can't happen to me. I can assure you, as sure as I'm standing here right now, it can happen to any one of us. We have to stand guard. We have to recognize that the Word of God has the boundaries we need for our lives so that we need not be a, a, a reproach to the things of God. Proverbs 25 verse 28 says, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. The inability of believers today to allow the Spirit of God to lead them in what they do and what they do not do is a reflection of an individual that's no longer in the Word of God. They are spiritually lazy. They perhaps are, are, are dangerously close to not even caring anymore. We know people like that. Come on, we know people like that. It's a tragedy. We see the effects of this sort of thing in our, in our world today. 
things that happened years ago, we see the effects when walls are broke down. I think back to the early 1960s, how that one woman, one woman was able to get prayer taken out of schools. Where were the believers? Where were the Bible-believing children of God? You can't tell me they cared. Oh, well, that's for our government to take care of. Friends, that's why we're in the shape we're in today. That was never God's intention. What about in the slaughterhouses or clinics dotted around our country today? You say, well, you know, the Supreme Court, they did a good deal and they, they give it back to the states. Okay. There's still millions and millions of babies being killed on the altar of convenience in the name of choice, for crying out loud. And do you know that I know some, some people who are Christian in name only who voted for individuals that support it? That's the effects of Christians that have become apathetic. That's, that's laziness personified. This one may step on toes if you're a parent or a grandparent. But did you know, we got, well, these kids are fine to, to, to say this in front of, but did you know that pornography is now uh, truly an epidemic? with children as young as 10 years old? Now I ask you, where are the boundaries? Where are the Bible-believing parents? The Bible-believing grandparents? That say, hey, hey, number one, you're not old enough for a phone. Can I get an amen on that? Hey, listen, I was 30 years old before I got a phone. Don't tell me you're too, that you're old enough. We need some parents today that have some boundaries still in place and, and, and they'll say no to a child. And if that child must have a phone, then there are parental controls, parents. How can it be that 10-year-olds, it's an epidemic today? Because it's accessible, it's right there. But we've got Christians today, we've got Bible-believing Christians today that are spiritually lazy. They ought to know better, they should know better, but they're lazy. They don't get into the Word so that God can convict. They're not faithful to God's house so that God can convict. And they've gotten to a place where they just don't care. Oh, little Susie, she'll be okay. Oh, little Billy, he'll be okay. You think so, huh? I'll tell you a story about a young lady named Amber, we'll call her. And the parents, my home church had gotten saved and man they were on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ Amber was a beautiful young lady I mean just absolutely beautiful had the whole world in front of her. smart intelligent good in school but in mom and daddy's eyes this they were saved but they were growing couldn't get it through their heads that they had to say no from time to time and they didn't know when to say no from time to time. They didn't set boundaries in Amber's life. And so Amber pretty well got to do what Amber wanted to do. This is 30 years ago. I'll never forget, I had just left to go to seminary. When I got the phone call, Amber's been killed. Just a month or so out of 
getting out of high school, graduating high school, planning on going to a university. She had snuck her mom and dad's car out and went drinking with some friends, rolled her car four times, and was killed. All because some parents didn't set boundaries. So many more I could tell you of. That when there aren't walls in place, when we don't know what those walls are, when, worse than that, when we become so lackadaisical spiritually that, that we don't even care. Again, maybe tongue in cheek. Maybe with a wink and a nod. But in reality, we don't care. And don't tell me you don't care if you don't do something about it, friends. You can't say you care about something that you do nothing with. We've got this book. It gives us all the instructions we need for, for life and, 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 and to, to, to be sanctified and, and to glorify our, our Heavenly Father and His Son. I love something that missionary Amy Carmichael said. She said, the amazing thing is that everyone who reads the Bible has the same joyful thing to say about it. In every land, in every language, it is the same tale. Where that book, the Bible, is read, not with the eyes only, but with the mind and the heart engaged, the life is changed. Sorrowful people were comforted. Sinful people were transformed. People who were in the dark walk in the light. She asked this question, is it not wonderful to think that this book Right here. Which is such a mighty power if it gets a chance to work in an honest heart. Is in our hands today. There's power in this book. There's power to avoid the destruction of boundaries that God has placed in your life. For your own good. And lastly, because we're running out of time. As Solomon always seemed to be able to do because of the wisdom God had granted him as he discerned that tragedy. He discerned what that tragedy taught him in verses 32 through 34. Look with me in verse 32. The Bible says that then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. You know what I find interesting about this, about Solomon here? And it's really something we need to, we need to emulate more ourselves. He took some time to consider what was going on, what he had just seen. The very first thing he does is he saw. Now, back up for just a minute. You go back up to verse 30. He said, I went by the field, and he noticed that field was a vineyard, and he noticed that the man that owned it was slothful and that he was void of understanding. He was lazy. Right? He was apathetic. Right? So he, he's already seen it. But now, now in verse 32, the Bible says that he saw. Here's what that means. Is that he really took a hard look. He, he didn't just walk by and say, What a shame. Such a beautiful vineyard. I remember when that vineyard was so pretty. Oh, it's such a shame that it's that way now. Not Solomon. No, Solomon stopped and he looked. He looked. 
He took a good hard look. He, he didn't just mumble about what he had w- witnessed. He, he took a hard look. He wanted, he wanted to learn a lesson. He, he wanted to absorb a lesson. And he wanted to, under the inspiration of God, give us that lesson. He saw. He paid attention. How many times do we come into God's house and we hear the word of God and yeah, God may touch us on one thing or that or the other or, or the pastor was funny here or there or the, the preacher said something really cool over here but when we leave here we couldn't tell you anything about it. We couldn't really tell you anything about what God's word said. We couldn't really tell you anything about what, what the man of God had to say. We haven't really considered it. Friends, that's dangerous. It's dangerous to be in that position. If you can leave God's house today and not know an hour from now what was preached, that's dangerous. There ought to be lessons being given here, not because Wade's preaching, but because God's Word is being spoken. Solomon, man, he, 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 he witnessed this thing and he saw it and he looked at it for what it was and he was real with it. Not just for the sake of bashing this man, but for getting instruction. You know what wisdom is, is closely tied to, to instruction. They're almost hand in glove. Secondly, it says he considered it well. That, that indicates when you look into the, real, the, the original language, it was more than just a thought process. It was more than just what was going on up here. It stirred his heart. Friends, can I ask you a question this morning? You don't, you're not answering me. But when's the last time God's word stirred your heart? When's the last time you heard God's word and you know he was speaking directly? To you. And I tell you, there is no more tragic situation than if you can sit here and say, I don't remember. I don't remember the last time God spoke directly to me. I'm going to tell you something. It, we can grieve the Holy Spirit of God by ignoring Him. You can grieve him so long that you'll quench him. Solomon didn't let that happen. He took this situation and he considered it well. Will you do the same this morning? Are you considering your own life? Or are you thinking about somebody else? And I love the next thing he it says that Solomon did. It says that he continued looking and received instruction. Because he put the effort in. You know what God's looking for? He's looking for people that want to draw close to him. The Bible says, draw nine to God and God will draw nine to thee. It works just like that. God's waiting for people that want what he has. Did you know that? Too many of us are coming into God's house, literally putting, folding our arms, maybe figuratively now, okay? Some of you got your hands folded. I don't want you thinking I'm picking on you. Unless you're asleep, I'm gonna, then I'm going to pick on you. But literally, some of us come in here with this spiritual attitude, bless me if you can, preacher. Bless me if you think you can. Hey, you're headed for tragedy. Do you want the blessing or do you want the tragedy? You need to consider it well. He continued looking and he received instruction. His heart was involved and he knew there was a lesson to be learned that he needed, so he received the instruction. And friends, when you get something from God, I'm going to tell you something, when you really get something from God, you aren't the same anymore. You can't be the same anymore. 
When God gives you a word, you can't be as you were before. It happened when you got saved, amen? You were in, you were in death, you met Jesus, and you were in life. You were born again instantly. Why? Because you received Jesus Christ. You receive His Word as a child of God. Guess what? Instantly you grow. There's a maturing that begins to take place. The problem is too many believers quit maturing. Why? Because they're lazy. Well, I just don't have time to read my Bible, Pastor. I'm not the pastor, but you know what I mean. I just don't have time to do that. Friend, you don't have time not to do that. You can't afford it. You can't afford to go through a day without a, a word from God. You know what's going to happen if you try to do it? Satan's going to fill it with something else. It's called the law of the vacuum. Nature abhors of uh, 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 empty, uh, emptiness. And so if, if God doesn't have his rightful place, guess what's going to take the place of him? Satan's going to jump right there in the middle of it. Receive instruction. Take it to heart. Put it to use. Allow God to do with you what he wants to do. I'm convinced that God's wanting to do some things with some people here at Liberty Baptist Church and, and they're, just, they're, they're just not receiving the instruction. They're willing just to keep going the way they've been going and they're not growing. Well, what did he discern? Verse 33 tells us, that, in verse 34, tells us exactly what he discerned after he considered it well. After he looked upon it and received instruction, he says, this is what I've learned. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. I want you to notice the progression here. It really gives me an understanding about this man that I've heard it preached so many different ways. But it really kind of gives me the understanding about this man. This man did not um, necessarily, I, I think, intend to get to this place. I don't think he intended for his vineyard to turn out the way it did. But it was a little progressive. It just little bites at a time. Little, little moments at a time. See, the first thing was is a little sleep. What's that? What? Innocent little cat nap. I'm going to have a cat nap today after church, amen? I promise you I am. She knows I am. Nothing wrong with a good little cat nap, but spiritually speaking, friends, it's dangerous. It's, it's dangerous. Oh, it won't, it won't hurt to miss church one time. No, when it'll hurt is when it's easier to miss the next time. A little sleep. Starts right there. Just a little nap. And then what? A little slumber. What's that? Well, that's your deeper sleep. That's your deeper sleep. That's the one that's harder to wake up from. That's when I haven't read my Bible in a week. I haven't re received anything from God in a week. I'm starving to death when I come to church on Sunday morning. Because I'm I malnourished. But then this is the dangerous one. A little folding of the hands. What is that? Just reconciliation to the fact that you're comfortable right where you're at. I've taken a little nap. I've taken a deep sleep. Yeah, you know what? This isn't so bad. I've missed church now two weeks in a row and hadn't read the Bible in two weeks. and Everything's still okay. The world hadn't fallen apart. Mark my words, it will. Mark my words, it won't be long till the weeds show up. Mark my words, boundaries that you have in your life right now that are, are absolutely non-negotiable in your head will go away. 
He said, Brother Wade, there's no way that will ever happen in my life. There's no way I'll ever allow that in my life. Friends, I'm going to tell you something. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands, guess what's going to happen? That non-negotiable you just told me about, it's gone. The wall's broken down. There is cause and effect. Failure to be diligent in Scripture spiritually opens us up to living as though we never even had the truth. And I know believers like that today. And can I tell you, there was a time, there was a time where it could be said of Wade Copeland. And I praise God for some godly people namely one of them being my pastor, that looked at me and said, what are you doing? That's scriptural, by the way. I'm grateful for it. Spiritual poverty is what you and I were called to bring people out of, not to live in, friends. Our lives are that vineyard. Do you see that? God's built this beautiful vineyard in your life. If you go over to, to John chapter 15, he tells you, tells you all about it. And in that passage, he says these words, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same shall bring forth much fruit. There's an abiding relationship that, that, that creates this beautiful vineyard we call life. Life this side of heaven. Did you hear me? Life this side of heaven. The abundant life that Jesus talked about. He wants to nurture that vineyard. You see, God's the husbandman. He's the one that tends the vineyard. Jesus is the vine, and we're branches within that vine. Let me tell you something. God is the husband. He don't let no walls get broke down. So why would we? Why would we allow weeds into our lives? Why would we allow things into our lives that at one time we would have said no way? Because a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of hands to sleep. The Bible says in verse 34, So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. And that literally just means you become something that's worthless. What a shame. In a world that needs Jesus more than ever before, that there would be a believer that is in that position. Oh, I beg God that that's not the case with any of us here this morning. And I, and I beg God that if it is, that he'll alert us and he's alerted us this morning and we'll deal with that thing today and we'll get those weeds pulled out today. Not tomorrow. Today. Would you stand with me with your heads bowed and your eyes closed this morning? Father God, it was your word this morning. I know how mightily you dealt with me regarding this passage, Lord, and all I can say, Lord, is I pray you've been glorified. And I pray your people have been warned. I know I was, Lord. I, I know I was warned. I know that I was chastised. I know that, Lord, you, you did what you needed to do in my life. And, 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 and Lord, I'm grateful for it. And Lord, I just pray that individually, the individual members that make up this body of Christ here at Liberty would recognize the responsibility they have to you and to one another, Lord, to keep the weeds out. Lord, to keep the walls, the boundaries in place. To not get lazy. Oh, dear God, if there's somebody that's gotten apathetic, Lord, stir their heart 
as only you can. And I recognize this morning, Lord, that amongst this group, Lord, there's very possibly somebody that they've just heard a message, Lord, that was aimed more towards the believer. But the fact of the matter is, Lord, their vineyard's already covered in weeds. The walls are non-existent because they have never had a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Father God, I'm asking you this morning that for that individual that's battling that truth, that you love them. And if there's not anything that should come between the love you have for them and them coming to Christ, Lord, there's not anything that should get in the way of that. Not fear, not embarrassment. We would never try to embarrass anybody, Lord. But Lord, I pray that you would do a work today as only you can. And that we'd be faithful, Lord, as a people to never be found as this man was who once had a beautiful vineyard. And he got to a place where he just didn't care anymore. Thy will be done. It's in Christ's name we pray. Some have already come this morning as music begins. If you need to come this morning, I'm sure I'll.